not easy to <coughs> understand and to relate to uh, Tisha B'Av altogether. What what is exactly the work that we have to do? What um, what's a mitzvah really? What message are we supposed to take away? What's the direction for the future? This time of day, one's allowed to start this time of day, one's allowed to start thinking <coughs> about about the future. In fact, um, many it was a custom among many rabbis to use the afternoon to be involved in community needs. One you can sit on a normal chair. There's definitely an element of accepting comfort, which is not just the complete hopelessness of last night. Let's try to put our heads into a bit of some of the understanding of some of the issues. One of the problems is that when you try to define what Tisha B'Av is, what the real work is, it's a little confusing. On the one hand, it's clearly a time of tshuva. Tshuva means to work on correction, self-correction, close off problematic directions that you've been involved in in the past and choose a new direction. That's the mitzvah of tshuva. The Rambam, when he gives the mitzvahs, when he explains what fast days are and he includes Tisha B'Av, he makes it very clear that it's it's an awakening. He says, La eris ala vavavos, that means to awaken the hearts. And there's no question that he puts it into the context of tshuva. The whole idea of fasting, the rabbis tell us that fasting without an awakening or an intention or, or thoughts about where you're at and where you're going is pointless. And therefore, there's no question that it's a fast like all others where tshuva is the, is the goal. And yet, we don't do tshuva. We don't have, we don't say vidui, we don't confess, we don't say slichas, we don't, we don't have any of the forms of, of tshuva. It's possible, there's no formal action of tshuva. One explanation for that is because it's a moed. Unlike other fast days, which are simply fasts, where the idea is the suffering that should awaken Shiva. So Tisha B'Av is a Maya. That means it's a festival. It's a Yom Tov. On Yom Tov, you don't, uh, you don't, you don't do Shiva. We don't do Slichas. We don't all the aspects of Shiva that are in one way heavy. That we don't do that on a Moed. And therefore, Tisha B'Av, being that it's a festival, which itself, of course, needs needs understanding. A festival that has the element of what we normally call joy, which is why we don't do these things, that needs understanding, but there's no question that it is called a moed, and so we don't do those things. And yet what we do do <coughs> is we fulfill the laws of availus of mourning. That it seems somehow that this tshuva takes the form of being a mourner. It's very, a very strange thing to have to understand that. <coughs> And we behave like mourners. In fact, the law is on Tisha B'Av. You have to be like somebody who has somebody's died in front of him. And we we fulfill, we, we, we follow the pattern of mourning. Although we eat, we don't eat and drink, whereas a mourner can eat and drink. But apart from that, we, we fulfill, as it were, the laws of mourning. All the details. Shoes, and not learning Torah, and... So there's a, there's not simple to understand this. Is it, what is the main idea here? Is it actually tshuva? And if so, why aren't we doing that? Is it simply mourning? And a question about mourning really is what does it achieve? What does mourning really achieve? Just to feel bad and to feel the pain of the situation? When one mourns for somebody who's died in one's family, no, we do that for, we do that because it's a kindness to the soul. The, the meaning of mourning is that when someone dies, they are no longer able to 
function in the world. They can't continue their journey in the world. The soul has not died. The neshama can never die. Only the, the neshama, the, the soul is separated from the body. And since it no longer has a body with which to operate, it can't move through the world, it can't, can't do in the world the things that make a difference to it. So that's a terrible pain for the neshama. And we, the laws of mourning are all designed to be a, an empathy. What we do when we mourn is we empathize with the neshama. We actually carry it on a journey. Right? We, we, the laws of mourning, like we don't like to talk about these things unless it's necessary. Today, today is a day of mourning, but all the things that we do in mourning are really, we try to live in, in synchrony or in, in, in empathy with the neshama that's not here. Right? That neshama no longer has a presentation in the world, has no garment with which to appear in the world. We tear our garments. It can't walk through the world. So we take our shoes off. You know that the meaning the meaning of shoes always in Torah, the meaning of shoes is always that the lowest part of the body, the part that doesn't have life, the part that's furthest from awareness, from consciousness, that part of the body which has death within it, the heels. Gemara says that after death the heels don't decompose because they're already dead when you're born. That's where the original serpent's poison is put into the human form. The heels are the thick, dead skin <coughs> at the bottom of the body that is very insensitive. That's the part of the body that's not alive. Always in Chazal, when they talk about Adam and the, the globe of his heel, talking about the lowest part of him, that's the part that, that's not alive. And that part fits into the shoes. That part of the body fits into the shoes, just like the lowest part of the soul fits into the body. There are five parts to the neshama. The lowest part is called the nefesh, that's the part that is not alive, or the part that's least spiritually alive, the part that connects with the body. And the function of the nefesh is to fit into the body. So a human being, if you had spiritual eyes and you looked at a person, you'd see a body, and beyond the body you'd see at least four parts, or depending on your spiritual ability to see, you'd see many parts, at least three of them you'd see stretching out beyond the head where the tefillin are worn, you'd see an indestructible spiritual being. And then you'd see fitting into the body the lowest part of that, those spiritual reels, those parts of the soul. The lowest part, the part that's relevant to a body, unlike the higher parts. And that fits into the body, and the body carries the soul through the world, exactly like the shoes carry the body over rough ground. That's the meaning of shoes. The Hebrew word for a shoe is the same as the word for a lock. That's the place where you lock into the world. Whenever you see in Torah shoes, and you see them many times. You're always looking at the idea of the soul locking into the world, into its body that carries it through the world. Whether it's Yom Kippur when we take our shoes off because we're beyond the world. And Yom Kippur is not a time of sadness. Yom Kippur is not a time, Yom Kippur is not a time of fasting in sadness at all. On the contrary, Yom Kippur is a, a real festival. The reason we don't eat on Yom Kippur is because the Neshama is so distant from the body it doesn't need it. In the old yeshivas they used to say that on Tisha B'Av they, they used to say on Tisha B'Av who could eat? On Yom Kippur they would say who needs to? Yom Kippur is a time when the Neshama floats it doesn't need food and therefore you take your shoes off. Chalitza when a woman when a man is meant to, meant to marry a woman for the sake of bringing down a soul to the world Marrying her, where there's a mitzvah to marry her, and, and bring her soul into her body. When he refuses to do that, the sign of disdain that she shows is she takes his shoe off. That's what chalitza means. She's saying to him, you're keeping your body and a soul apart. It couldn't be a more clear expression of that. That's what chalitza means. To take off his shoe is a very clear expression of disdain. You have the ability to marry me and bring a child into the world, a soul into her body, which is the greatest gift you can give, and you're refusing to do that, you're keeping him apart. She takes his shoe off. The Kohanim, the, the priests in the base of Mikdash, whose absence we mourn today, they serve without shoes, even though they are many garments, but shoes they don't have. The reason is they're in a higher world. They're halfway between this world and another world. And in that world, they're separated from this world, so they have no shoes on. When Hashem speaks to a prophet and invites him to raise himself, to lift himself out of the physical world, the first thing he says, take your shoes off. When God appears to any prophet, the first words he says to him, appears to Moshe, and is, Shal na alecha na take your shoes off your feet. God can't speak to a man with his shoes on. 
No, the idea is that if you want to speak to me, you want to lift yourself into the realm of prophecy where you transcend the body. You take your shoes off. That's the message. The message is unlock yourself from the physical world. When Hashem speaks to Moshe Rabbeinu, He says, take of your shoes. When He speaks to Yeshua, Joshua, He says, take of your shoe. Moshe Rabbeinu is completely out of this world. And Joshua is one foot in and one foot out. He's the bridge. He's the bridge phase. But wherever you look in Torah, you'll see, and there are many customs in Jewish communities. When a person dies, as many communities have a custom that no one's allowed to wear their shoes again. Because in Gibraltar, they have a custom that when a person dies, they destroy the person's shoes each in two different places. The pair of shoes are separated. So nobody should ever wear those shoes again. And therefore, <coughs> the meaning of shoes is that on Tisha B'av, we act like mourners. A mourner takes his shoes off because he's acting in empathy with the soul that no longer is in the body. The soul is separated from the body. It's not inside the vessel that carries it through the world. It has no shoes on, and therefore, you take your shoes off. And all the things, the, nes- the neshama can no longer walk in the world, so you sit, that's called shiva. It can't express itself, so there's a silence. That's what mourning is. And the purpose of the mourning is to carry that neshama on its journey. The Rambam says very, very amazingly, he says, if you fail to mourn for someone in your family, where you have an obligation to mourn, and of course it's family that you have to mourn for, because it's the same neshama, that's the same root of, of neshama, you can carry them on their journey, because you're deeply bound with them. So the Rambam says, somebody who fails to mourn is guilty of cruelty. That's the language he uses. Achzarius, he says, a person who does not warn for a relative is guilty of cruelty. Cruelty, you could have helped them. You could have carried them on their journey. You didn't do that. Right? That's the mitzvah of mourning. It isn't simply a psychological adjustment and a taking leave and a coming to terms. That's all fringe fringe benefits. The real mitzvah of mourning is to carry that soul on a, on a journey. And therefore, somebody doesn't do that. They're being cruel. They could, they could help, and they're not helping. And on Tisha B'Av, the question really is, what neshama... What soul really is it that we're relating to? Whose soul really? And the truth is, there is a neshama. There's a shkina that's departed from the world. The shkina fits into the base of Mikdash, like the soul fits into the body, the place of connection, if you like, the place of meeting of the spiritual and physical worlds. Is the is the base of Mikdash? Is the temple? So let's try to let's try to think through this. So what we're saying so far is that we have somehow an an, an awakening to Chiva. The form that it takes somehow is a is a mourning. The form of the mourning is really the most the most explicit form of the mourning that we have on Tishabab is crying really. Is crying. Even though a mourner it's not so clear that there's an obligation to cry. There's an obligation to do the other aspects of mourning. Crying is not so clear. But on Tishabab definitely it's called it to all the time of crying. Tishabab is crying because when the spies came back and there was a useless and needless night of crying, is set in motion a crying forever. The real, the real reason for the crying was not simply because Israel and the final destiny of a, a reconstructed world was not going to happen, but because that was the day when it should have happened. <coughs> you know that the Medrash says that Hashem wanted to give us a festival in every summer month. Every month of the summer needs a festival, right? Of course it does. Every month, the summer months are the months of reaping the harvest. It's the time when things are alive. The summer is the time that should be spiritually the greatest time. The winter is the dark time. The summer should be the time of greatness. And therefore, there should have been the greatest festivals of all. The, the real, the, the, the high holy days should have been in, in Tammuz, Avon, Elul. Nisan has Pesach. Iyar has Pesach Sheni. Sivan has Shvurs. And the next three months of the summer were meant to have the highest festivals. In fact, Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah was meant to be in Tammuz. It was supposed to be the 17th of Tammuz. Yom Kippur was supposed to be the 9th of Av. Elul, another one. Sukkot. Each of those months was meant to have a festival. And the, the, the process crashed. And therefore they were all compressed later. They are given in, in Tishrei. They are all put into one month, which is unusual. This is the reason. And Tishrei should have been Yom Kippur. The taking off of the shoes that we do on Tisha B'Av is a very sad 
very a tragic reminder of the fact that it should have been a Yom Kippur type of stepping out of the physical in elevation, not stepping out to sit on the floor and crying. That was the crying. The saddest times in life are the times when a tragedy occurs that should have been a time of rejoicing. Something when a, when a, when a joy turns to sadness, that's the greatest. That's what tragedy is. And therefore, that was what the crying was all about. And crying means that. Crying means when a process tragically comes to an end. I'm sure we'll hear later more about crying, but the idea of crying is that every aspect of the body, every function of the body, is always a reflection of something in the spiritual world. Right? The reason the body is created the way it is, the reason we, we do the things we do, right? two very strange aspects of human functioning are laughing and crying. Very strange. Very strange. If you have one, if one ever have a little fun with an evolutionist, try and get him to explain to you why we needed to laugh and cry in order to survive. That's impossible. It's ridiculous. It's no evolutionary mechanism. Crying and laughing are very deep spiritual, purely spiritual aspects of the human being. You don't need to cry in order to survive. Crying weakens you, in fact. But the expression we have in the world, we have an expression of laughter, which is incoherent, and we have an expression of crying, which is incoherent. And crying means the response, what it is, it's the outer expression of, of a journey that comes to a tragic end when there's no, not that the journey's ended, but there's no possibility of the journey continuing. There's no direction. Can't see the road ahead. The word bechi in Hebrew, which is crying, is the same as the Hebrew word for a maze. Bechi is the same as mevucha. Nevuchim heim ba'aretz. They're lost in the land. Bechi means, a maze is a place where you can't see the road ahead. We always cry. Crying is always generated by a situation where there's no road ahead. Right? When there's a road ahead that's difficult, you don't cry. You strengthen yourself and you, you deal with it. Crying is when there's no way to go, no nowhere to go, no way to go. And Bechi means, and the aspects of the body show that too. Crying is incoherent, coherent speech becomes impossible, it's a broken sound that doesn't construct anything. The eyes tear, which means you can't see clearly, no direction to be seen. Tears themselves are an expression of confusion. The word Dema, Dema, Dima in Hebrew means a tear, but it also means to be mixed up means to be mixed when the tears form the Torah says that at the end of the Torah Moshe Rabbeinu Moses wrote about his own death the last eight verses they talk about his death and Moses died and the question the Gemara asks on that is how could he write about his own death is not true the Torah has to be true how could a living man write about his death in the past tense and Moses died and was buried in a certain place. How could he write that? The Torah has to be true. So there's one answer that Joshua wrote those verses, which is very problematic because the Torah was written by Moshe. There's another answer that he wrote it crying. He wrote it crying. There's a very famous idea of the Gona Vilna that ties the two together. But Dema means he wrote it crying, meaning not that he wrote it weeping, but he wrote the words without any spaces between the letters. The letters were all jumbled. He wrote those eight verses in jumbled letters, which means he didn't. He wasn't writing about his death. He was writing a jumbled string of letters because the whole Torah has to be written by him. Joshua separated the words afterwards. Joshua came and he separated those letters into the words that mean and Moshe died, which means, of course, Moshe Rabbeinu did write the whole Torah. And Joshua only came to, to sort out and clarify what was meant when those letters were, were written. But the question is, the question is, if he wrote them crying, how does that answer the question? He wrote them crying. According to the opinion, that means <coughs> he wrote about his own death, weeping. <coughs> how does that satisfy the need for him to write the truth? If he's not allowed to write that he died, because it hadn't happened yet, <coughs> how do you solve the problem by saying it's okay because he wrote it crying? It still hadn't happened. <coughs> the Maral explains this. The Maral says crying is an aspect of death. Crying is already an aspect of death. It's the part of death that you feel in life, you, you've entered a zone of no no movement and no place forward. That's what death is. Death is when the Nisham has no mechanism to move forward. And if a person who's really weeping, a person who really weeps, is experiencing a, an aspect of death, there's no... Uh, they've entered that incoherent f stage where there's no journey, there's no life journey to be undertaken. And therefore, says the Maral, Moshe Rabbeinu wrote it crying, he wrote it crying, is already fulfilling the beginning of his death. That's what it is, really. That's the crying. The crying of Tisha B'Av is the 
It's that aspect of mourning. The aspect of mourning of experiencing the death. And therefore, I think that the, the step that this pushes us to take is to understand what is it, you know, for modern people to cry about a temple that really we never lost in the first place, we never lacked in the first place. I mean, do we really wake up in the morning feeling a tragedy that's in a building in Jerusalem where sacrificial process has happened? And, but it's really, it's fundamental to understand what that means. If this is the thing that has died, and to be expected to cry about it and to relate to it, you understand what that means. And what it means is that the Beis HaMikdash isn't simply a place that represents, you know, it's a fine building of the Jewish people and a sort of a national monument and a national center. The Beis HaMikdash is a place where this world connects with the spiritual world. And when that happens, this world looks the way it should. If you like, when the Beis HaMikdash is not there, the world is manifesting a death. There's no soul in the in the body, right? We walk around like corpses. We walk around in a world where where there is no life, where, where, where life and death are, are so confused that today there's not even a pretense and having, don't even have to pretend to have values, right? Where it's an excuse to, to protest, then what behavior do you see when people protest? They start stealing. As soon as there's an opportunity, they start stealing. That's how you protest. Uh, you know, that's how you make a political point. You rob someone else. including a descent into violence. <coughs> the the Besa Mikdash means that the soul is in the body. You know that the world has ten concentric layers of Kedusha. The Major says the world has ten circles of sanctity. The world is normal. Then you cross a border. There are many layers. When you move into Israel, cross the border into Eretz Israel, that has a higher level of Kedusha. Things are different there. The space, that means the dimension of space, which is the center of the dimension of space, is Yerushalayim and the Beis HaMikdash. And space has levels of ascent. Space in the world is space. It's normal. You have a distance. You have space. You go to, to Israel, the space is different. There the Gemara says, our sources say that no one ever... It's, Israel is called Eretz Tzvi. Tzvi means, means a deer. And one of the qualities of a deer is that the skin, when the skin is removed from the deer, doesn't seem to be enough skin to cover the deer. No matter how small Israel is, it's always big enough for everyone. It's an unusual, elastic type of space. But when you move into Yerushalayim, it's completely different. Yerushalayim is a different aspect of space. There the, there the Mishnah says that no one, said they, no one ever said they couldn't find a place to stay in Yerushalayim. Even when hundreds of thousands of people coming for the festivals three times a year, that's more miraculous, more, more flexible in its unusual manifestation of space. And when you move into the temple, you move into the Azorah, the outer courtyard of the temple, there there's no sense of space at all. There there's completely miraculous manifestation. You're having, you're moving close to the place where space is formed, where the world was created. There people used to stand shoulder to shoulder on Pesach, when everyone had to fit in. Hundreds of thousands of people standing together, completely squeezed together shoulder to shoulder. And when it came time to bow down, there was plenty of place for everybody to lie down. Plenty of place. You occupy much less floor space standing. When you lie, you occupy much more space. And nevertheless, when they lay down, there was plenty of space. And then the Musa say it means because when you're standing, there's an assertion of ego, you're on your feet, then everyone's crowding, crowding each other. When you annul your ego, when you bow down and submit, then there's plenty of place for everybody. Then you take up less of the world of your own self-assertion. But there was a miraculous manifestation of space. And when you went into the Holy of Holies, there was no space at all. There, the, the, the Chazals say you could measure from one wall to the other, and you got the same measurement as if you measured from the wall to the Orin. The Orin, Enomin Amida, that occupied no space. You could measure from wall to wall, including the Orin, or excluding it, you got the same space. The same measurement. And it's not because the Orin shrank. If it shrank, it would be invalid. It has certain halakhic measurements. And if the room expanded, it would also be invalid. The temple has certain required halakhic measurements. Therefore, you have a miraculous, paradoxical... You're at the center of space now where space itself is coming into being. And that moving towards the center of Yushalayim. You go to Yushalayim, the Beis Mikdash is the place where the formation of the world takes place. That's where the world comes into existence. And of course in time as well, in time as well, you have to move there as well. You move there, the world ascends there in terms of space. On Regolim, you move towards Yushalayim. It doesn't come to you. You have to go there to receive the bracha. 
It's the center. And therefore, when that is connected, when things are happening, the base of Mikdash is built, it means there's a flow of energy into the world. And ideally, when it's correctly connected, when it was first built, when King Solomon built the base of Mikdash, the world was peaceful. He fought no wars. During his reign, when the base of Mikdash was standing, it meant there was a place of meeting of the Shekhinah, the divine presence was in the world, and the world, this doesn't mean that it was a nice thing, you could go there and you have spiritual experiences, it means that the world functioned the way it should. There was no chaos and mayhem and war and <coughs> brutality, and then no wars were fought. It was a peaceful world, the kings and queens of the world came to Jerusalem to pay homage to. That was the closest we ever got to a pre-Messianic vision. You want to know what the Mashiach will look like in his first phase? The years when he reigned, the world experienced such a thing. There was a peaceful world, there was no political strife, the world was settled and calm. Torah values pervaded the world. Human life was pitched at the value that it should be. The world was perfect. Each person under his vine and his fig. No arguments. No tension. Imagine Jews without argument. Very miraculous manifestation. That's what it was. And therefore, <coughs> a world like that means... You know, the, the Besamekdash is a place of connections. What happens in the Besamekdash? It's worth understanding this. The Besamekdash, the Torah calls the neck of the world. The neck. In Shira Shirim, it talks about his wife and her beauty. His young husband talking about her grace and her beauty. He, called, he talks about Kemigdal Tzavarech, like the tower of your neck. Whenever you see the neck in Torah literature, it always means the Besamekdash. The neck is the part of the body that connects the head with the body. It connects the dimension of thought and spirituality and concept and potential. It connects it with the body. And therefore the Beis HaMikdash is called the neck of the world. It's where the higher dimension of Hashem's presence, the intellect, the brain, the spirit of the world is connected with the world. And therefore it's always called the neck of the world. Migdal means the tower. When the people, who, the evil dimension, the evil generation of people wanted to build the Iro Migdal. They wanted to build a city and a tower and use that tower to reach Hashem and wrest control of the world from Him. So the Kabbalistic Midrashim say they were trying to build Yerushalayim in the base of Mikdash. Iru Migdal. There's only one ear, only one city, that's Jerusalem. There's only one Migdal, one tower, that's the base of Mikdash. It doesn't mean they were trying to build a high building. It wasn't geographically that if you put enough bricks together, you'll reach God. But if you put bricks together correctly, you'll reach God because that's the spiritual, that's the body. If you construct a living body, it has a soul in it. If you construct Yerushalayim, the base of Mikdash is built correctly, the Shekhinah comes into it. That's what they were trying to build. And therefore it's called the neck of the world because the neck is the place, the neck is where voice is formed, the voice is formed in the neck, in the Beit Sabitash Hashem's voice is heard. It's the conduit for all nerve energy and all food energy and all breathing. The neck is the place that can make life possible. Right? Why do you have a neck? Why did God, you could have walked around like this. Why did God give you a neck? The neck is that part of the body that teaches you the world of connection. And the temple is called that, the Beit Sabitash is like that. The world without the Beis HaMikdash is like a person with his throat slit. And what happens in the Beis HaMikdash? It's the place of connection. In, in Kabbalistic writings, it's referred to as the mouth of the world. The mouth, the Beis HaMikdash is the mouth of the world. What does the mouth do? The mouth has three functions. The mouth has three functions, and we know that if one part of the body has more than one function, they must be connected, or they wouldn't have been put in the same part of the body. The mouth has the functions of eating, speaking, and kissing. Three functions, natural human functions of the mouth. Why are they all in one organ? They're all aspects of connection. Eating is a connection. Eating is always bringing the spirit into the... When you eat food, right? It's connecting the soul into the body. When you don't eat, you fast, you get faint. If you don't eat long enough, there'd be a permanent separation. Eating is always the energy of connection. And by the way, that's why people eat together too. Eating also connects people. When we have three people together, we make a Muslim in a special way. Ten people in another way. We celebrate by eating together, right? All Jewish festivals. It's eating together. is very important. It's, a, it's not just why you enjoy your food more when you can talk to somebody else. It's between mouthfuls. It's not like that. It's The eating is itself is a connection. And speaking is a connection. Speaking is connecting the spiritual world of ideas and manifesting them in the world. Speaking connects people. Speaking is used for a term of intimacy in Torah. And kissing. Kissing is that intimacy. What is the meaning of kissing? Why do human beings, why were we why do all cultures express closeness by kissing? It's ridiculous, it's absurd, it's medically dangerous. It <laughs> make any sense? Mother wants to express love for a child, she's got to smear germs, slobber all over the... Ridiculous. There's much more refined ways you could have thought of of having people express their connection to each other. 
but it's it's a very deep reason. The mouth is the organ of connection, and that is those are the three functions in the mouth. And the base of Mikdash has those three functions. In the temple, they're speaking, speaking. Hashem speaks between the two golden kruvim is where the voice is heard. <clears throat> That's where His voice is heard. Without the temple, you don't hear that voice. When the base of Mikdash left, the prophecy left, and now we live in a completely dark world. There's no conversation possible. We call out, but in the darkness. And it's a place of eating. The Rav Shachayim explains that's where the sacrifices are offered. That's where the world eats. That's why the world is almost moribund at the moment. There's no ability to feed the Shechina without going into all the difficult Kabbalistic ideas. The Shechina occupies the world because that's where it's fed. Food is necessary. Food is that creation needed to keep the spirit in the body. The altar is called Shulchan Gavua. It's called Hashem's table. Every offering has salt and water and wine. All the laws of meals. As Korbani Lachmi, the sacrifices are called Hashem's bread. We think a sacrifice is a very strange thing. If we understood it correctly, we'd, we'd mourn much more to understand what we don't have. The world eats there. Food is elevated there into the spiritual world and it keeps the spirit connected with the, with the world and it's the place of kissing. The Gemara says that the Besamekdos is Asr the Nashki Shmayav Aradadi, where heaven and earth kiss. Of course they kiss there. That's where there's that intimate connection. And Shira Shirim that talks about it, he's talking about the intimate connection between husband and wife. That's where Hashem is meeting His people. That's where the world has the spirit manifest. And therefore, the absence of Beis Amikdash is not a cultural phenomenon. We don't have a, you know, a rallying point and we can't, you know, meet there on Yom Tov. The absence of Beis Amikdash means that the world's not alive spiritually. And therefore, every morning is a product of that. Everybody, every, every one of us in this room have had someone in their family who's died. It's a product of this problem. Right? Death is in the world because that reconstruction has not taken place. And all aspects of death, whether it's the senseless brutality and torture and cruelty and all the torment that the world... You know, individual tragedy, individual loneliness and frustration and lives that appear to be going nowhere without opportunity to even begin a direction... The morning is very real. It's not morning for a building that once was and will come again. It's a morning for the lack of that that connection. Uh, you don't, the person doesn't feel this. They doesn't feel the the sadness of the world and the the risk and the danger of the world and the the, the impending and hovering chaos and tragedy and brutality and death at every moment. So no hope for a person who doesn't feel that. But, and therefore the day is a day. It's a day of crying, of sensing, of feeling. It's not true in the sense that I'm doing tshuva and I'm saying vidui and I'm going to be a better person. It's not. That's not the work. The work is to experience and understand what's being. There's no greater motivation to move ahead in the days that are coming <coughs> than understanding what it is. What has been lost? What has died? <coughs> what is this This crying and this mourning? That is the beginning of tshuva. This is the time of day. We can speak about that already. <coughs> about making plans for the future and about choosing a direction. Anyone who comes out of Tisha B'Av and hasn't deeply felt that there's a problem and that he or she can make a difference. Right? It's failed completely. You've fasted for nothing. And therefore, this is the time to understand that. The, the process of moving ahead has to be a process of moving towards reconnection. You know, maybe close with this thought. The tragedies are expressed by Yirmiya. Jeremiah, he wrote Eicha, he wrote the book of Jeremiah, the unmitigated tragedy. He prophesied the destruction. And the healing is given by Yeshaya. <clears throat> Demon says what what Yirmiya came to give blows, Yeshai came to heal. <clears throat> Chazon Yeshai, we begin <clears throat> the Shabbos of impending tragedy with a message that is a, a vision of Yeshai, which also has within it healing. And if you look in Yeshai, you'll see that all his prophecies, Demon says this, Midrashim say, he was sent to give double prophecies, doubled always. Nachamu, Nachamu. Look, you'll see his language is always Shayv Ashuv Nachamu Nachamu. It's always the the language of duplication. That's the language of his. Look at the ne next seven weeks that are coming in the Torahs that we read. They all manifest this doubled, beginning with Nachamu Nachamu, and always in Torah where a word is doubled, it means a connection between the spiritual and the physical world. It's always like that. No doubled words in case you hadn't heard it the first time. The other time doesn't work that way. There's doubled words because you're talking about the spiritual and the physical coming together. 
<coughs> Yeremia doesn't do that. <coughs> he talks about the separation. But now we start reading Yeshaya, we start moving towards the goal, which is the goal of bringing back the Neshama into the body, that spirit into the world. <coughs> and Hashem speaks to His great people, He calls them twice. He says, Moshe, Moshe, Avram, Avram. It's always like that. Avram, Avram. So there's a grammatical separation between the two because He's not exactly the same in the spiritual world as He is here. Moshe, Moshe. There's no separation because He... <clears throat> he completely occupies the spiritual world, so his body and his soul are really one. There's no separation. But that is that is what we are moving towards. We've come out of three weeks of tragedy, and the obligation is to feel it, and to feel the separation, and to feel the frustration. It's not the directed chuva of exactly what I'm going to do. It's a feeling of... The co- this... Yeah, can't get any worse. And that's what the prophets are there to tell us, is that it will get better. That's the one of the three things all the prophets come to tell us. They come to tell us that Torah hasn't ended. Prophecy continues in some way. They come to warn us, frighten us, and also come to tell us in the same, the same group of people, the same prophets who come to bring us the terror, bring us the message that it will get better. So,